So welcome to Home on the Hill speaker series. My name is Joni and I'm and I coordinate the Monday afternoon caregiver connection program, the speaker series, the open discussion group, the caregiver luncheon, and I provide navigation mental health services for families and caregivers. Home on the Hill has one supportive housing with five residents. Uh, we have a recreation therapist that provides services such as art program, music program, peer support program, and games afternoon. We also have a caregiver art program. And if you would like to find out more about any of these programs, you can email me or go look on our website. I would like to introduce Dan Matway, MBA, CFP, a financial advisor, who will be talking about securing the land securing the future, navigating the financial landscape. Uh, Dan, uh, I have put his website in all my emails, but you know I can send it to you after. It's www.homeofthersp.ca. Dan uh, went to Wilfrid Laurier and has a certified financial planner to professional designation. Um, and he is licensed in uh, Ontario as a life insurance and mutual funds. And he works through Desjardins Financial Security Independent Network and Desjardins, Desjardins Final Security Investments. So Dan, Dan is, is really unique. I've had many speakers on this, on this topic, but Dan has a personal interest because he had a passion of watching his own brother and sister courageously deal with schizophrenia over the years. Through his family experience, he understands the challenges that exist and help out and then put, help put strategies in place to secure the financial future for his family member and his entire family. There's enough emotional turbulence uh, as it is and financial uncertainty that need not and does not have to be part of it. We struggle every day with our family members and having that extra layer on top of us you know, thinking about financial future, who's going to help after we're gone, you know, and these are things that are really precious to all of us because we worry about the future of our families and our children. Uh, Dan also uh, has done a lot of community work at the Homewood Health Center. He's been a, a volunteer for many years, and so he has been involved in Canadian mental health and addiction treatment. I'd like to welcome Dan and and uh, introduce you to everybody. And we're all interested in hearing what you have to say. So we'll take right. it away, Dan. Well, thank you for the introduction. Well, it's not, um, the first part is a personal reflection just to say who I am. But Joan, you pretty well covered all of that in the, <laughs> in the <laughs> intro. So I, um, you know, as Joni did say, I have both a brother and sister who have um, struggled with schizophrenia since their late teens. Uh, my brother is two years older than me. My sister is three years older than me. So for me personally, I have had a perspective on this as, as a sibling. I've seen what it, what it does to, to parents, clearly what it does to them. And um, yeah, and, and it's, been, it's, it's been a challenge. And, and both, to be honest, are, are doing pretty well right now. They both live in supportive housing as well. My brother is in Oakville. My sister is in uh, downtown or in, in Parkdale in Toronto. Um, I've been in the financial services industry since 2006. After I went back to school, I um, took on a new career. Um, no idea what I was going to do in financial services. And then shortly thereafter, the RDSP was was introduced into, into legislature. It was supposed to come into effect in 2007. It got delayed by a year, then it came into effect in 2008. So, so that's really where I've been focusing on my my business for the last you know 16 years now, um, since since 2008 or so. I um, and and I it is because of my personal situation. I, I think I can identify and relate well to family. So I'm gonna you know I'm going to talk about tonight. I understand some people have been through. Uh, sat and listened to speakers before it, to varying degrees. Some some know all about the RDSP, some don't. Some know all about the disability tax credit, the criteria and, and how to get an RDSP. Others are more interested in estate planning and perhaps Henson trusts. 
Others want to know how to protect government benefits. So I'm going to kind of cover the whole gamut in, in, in general terms. And, um, and hopefully, yeah, as questions, as Joni said, if you have questions, probably better to put them through the chat because I won't actually be looking at the chat. I'll be looking at this, but Joni can, can interrupt me, let me know. So what we're going to talk about is I'll, I'll go through the RDSP itself in an overview. Um, I'm going to talk about protecting ODSP, uh, and, and most people will be familiar with ODSP, um, Ontario Disability Support, the program. Um, I'm going to talk about estate planning. I'll, I'll personalize that quite a bit and how it is from, from my family situation. And when I do that, bear in mind, I'm, I'm not a lawyer, so I'm not giving legal advice. Um, all I'm doing, I, I just want to touch on some of the general principles um, and things that I think are important for people to think about and to consider. Um, and I, I specifically will talk about Henson Trust in that respect. And, you know, again, not being a lawyer, just in general, what, what it is, some of the things you'll want to talk to your lawyer about if that's a route you're going to go. Um, then I'll just talk a little bit more about, um, yeah, the, the planning aspect. How do you, how do you go about doing planning if, um, you know, if you've got a, a, a family with it, with a child, with a, with an illness or a disability of sorts. It's, um, it's a little bit different, to be honest, when you're dealing with families such as this. If I was, you know, if I was an expert in, in certain areas of, um, of, of, of taxation or, or insurance, and I'm talking about businesses and business trusts, business owners would be very quick. Yeah, that makes sense. That makes money. Where do I sign? What do I do? When we're talking in this situation, that's where the emotional impact is so so challenging at times that it's it's really hard to kind of move along and make decisions financially. So I'll always suggest kind of listen to what you're, whatever you hear today, if something kind of hits you and it's like, yeah, that, that's something I haven't done that maybe I should do, just take one thing maybe that you should do next and, and, and work on that and go a step at a time. It can be so overbearing to try and think of everything and, and try and get it all done that inevitably Quite often, nothing gets gets done, and I'll I'll talk to families. I'll do a seminar, and five years later, I'll hear from somebody who is, you know, now we're ready to do some of the things you talked about, which is great, and I'm and I'm glad they do. But there are little steps you can take in between, so just keep that in mind as we um, as we go along. And again, ask questions as we go, because I'm really not sure what level of knowledge those listening um, have on these various topics. So I'll start with the RDSP. So. As I mentioned, I came to the industry in 2006. This was launched in 2008. Um, for those of you who have investments and have been around a little while, you'll remember the last great financial crisis before the roller coaster ride we've been on the last few years was at the, the subprime crisis in, in, in 2008, where, where kind of the, the global economy was falling to pieces. And, um, to our government's credit, even though 2007 it was supposed to be done and it, it got delayed that year, they went ahead in 2008 and lost this anyhow at the end of the year. And um, there are different countries in the world that have different programs, but in all honesty, I think I think the RDSP is, is probably the best, the best I've seen or heard of. Um, we're gonna go through it. You're going to see the financial benefit, the protection benefit, but um, you know, that, this is when it started. Um, just for your for your own knowledge, there is a two hundred thousand dollar lifetime contribution limit. So what that means, that's the contribution limit. Because somebody will inevitably want to ask this question later, so I'll just address it right now. When I talk about grants and bonds, that's not a contribution. So this doesn't mean that the an RDSP can never go above two hundred thousand dollars. What this means is that the contributions by the account holders can can go up to $200,000. In, in 10, 15, 20 years, I've already got RDSPs worth over $200,000, but you'll, you'll see RDSPs worth half a million, 400,000, 600,000, 700,000, because they'll have been fully funded and they'll have had time to grow. So it's really, an RDSP's purpose is really to be, it's like a pension for, for the individual. Um, the, the other thing you can keep in, uh, you want to keep in mind is the, the account holder for an RDSP. Um, many of you may be aware of this, some of you may not. The beneficiary, where it says there are one account per beneficiary, which by the way is important. This isn't like an RSP or a TFSA, for example, where you can, 
You can go to a bank on every corner and open an RSP. You can have five, 10, 15 RSPs if you want. Same with tax-free savings accounts, bank accounts. An RDSP, there is only one allowed per beneficiary because the government will keep track of that to see where the grants, bonds, and everything else are. So, so the beneficiary is the individual with whom the RDSP is for. That's the person with the tax credit, which I'm gonna talk about in detail in a minute. So the account holder is the person who manages the plan. So currently the account holder can be A, the beneficiary, the, the individual who the plan's for. It can be a, a guardian. Um, so if somebody has guardianship or a public guardian and trustee has guardianship, they can manage the plan getting guardianship is extremely costly and and, and a lot in a long legal process for our dsps the other individuals who can be account holders are parents grandparents and as of fairly recently a sibling can now also be the account holder so this doesn't require a formal um you know power of attorney necessarily or any of that legal process the the account holder can be the, the individual who, if, if, the, if the beneficiary isn't capable, doesn't have the wherewithal, or, or will go through episodes where it's, it's, it's not in their best interest to be the, the account holder, then by all means, uh, more often than not, it's, it's, it's parents, especially when in, in the field I'm dealing with. So, so let's just keep that in mind who the, the account holders can, can be. Um, so how do you... How do you go about getting a registered disability savings plan? So there are four, really four criteria. First of which is you have to be a recipient. A recipient has to qualify for the disability tax credit. I'm gonna talk, talk about that in more detail shortly. The other three are very straightforward, less than 60 years of age, Canadian resident, valid social insurance number. So you're either under 60 or you're not, you're either a Canadian resident or you're not, and most people have a social insurance number. So those those three are, are fine if you're if you're over or out of one of those you're not eligible. The it's the disability tax credit that um, I'm going to say is problematic for for lack of a better word because what the best disability tax credit does and this is actually a very good time to be talking about it because it's it's tax time. So so you're filling out your taxes right now. Or you will be shortly. And if you've done charitable donations and or or you're a senior and you've got an age credit, there are different tax credits that you can use that will, so I'm gonna just, as I see admit come up, I'm just gonna hit the blue button. I, I, I think I've got a journey where I'm admitting people now as they come along. Um, so what a tax credit will do is, you know, if you've paid tax on your, your employment income, your pension income, capital gains, whatever it might be, um, a tax credit will reduce the amount of tax you pay. So many times somebody who has a disability may have no taxable income. Um, if Let's say for example, their only income is Ontario Disability Support. They're on ODSP, ODSP isn't taxable. So you get your benefits, you pay no tax. A tax credit isn't gonna reduce anything because there's no tax to pay. So people might think, well, what's the, what's the benefit, of, benefit of having the tax credit? The tax credit, the benefit of having it is it qualifies you for this program. The other important component of the tax credit is that it can be transferred, usually to parents. Um, if that person you're transferring it to, um, the individual is dependent upon them in one of the you know, main financial areas, support, shelter, or, or food, shelter, and clothing. So th those are kind of the three criteria. So, so for example, my brother and sister, neither one of them has lived with my mom for the past 30 years. Um, but she's had the tax credit transferred to her for all of those years because with their income, as limited as it may be, um, she will help them to a degree with, with either food or clothing, usually going shopping or helping them out in, in that aspect. So it's reasonable for the government to realize, yeah, on that level of income, a, a parent is, they're financially dependent upon somebody because they, to, to have a, you know, a quality of life. So that tax credit being transferred, now the individual who it's transferred to, they can claim the tax credit. So my mom for the last 30 years can claim the disability tax credit. For, for an adult, that will amount to 15, 1600 a year, dollars a year roughly. For somebody under the age of 19, so for my clients who have somebody with, with autism, for example, or three or four or five, six years old, 
it's a, it's a different level that the tax credit is higher for miners. So that's how the tax credit works. The other part of that part when you transfer it. So somebody who's who's maybe looking at opening up an RDSP today, or they're looking, they've got their job and they're saying, well, first step number one is we've got to, we've got to go apply for the tax credit. Um, it's a, a tax credit form seems to change all the time. The recent one is it's called a T2201. Just Google that and you'll find a 16 page document that is kind of overwhelming. The only parts you really need to concern yourself with are the first two pages, because that will say who's the recipient of the tax credit. And then it will say on the second line of that first page, who's the person claiming the tax credit. So that's not, that's if it's another individual. So in my mom's case, it would be her. The tax credit is retroactive. It can go back up to 10 years for to reclaim your taxes. So that's why if you ever see ads on, on the internet, you're, you're going somewhere and you see an ad or on TV it says, have a disability, get $15,000, get $30,000. This is what they're talking about. There are a lot of organizations that will be out there trying to get people to do this. Um, I always suggest trying to use your own practitioner, doctor, psychiatrist, whoever it might be, because it's um, I, I, it's far more advantageous in my mind if the practitioner knows the individual within that tax credit for. But if, if that does get filled out by a doctor or a practitioner on that page, and for, for if we're talking about mental, mental health, it's basically page 11 of, of this form. That's the part the doctor's gonna fill out. Um, and it will say when you know when was the onset. So somebody, for example, is 25 years old, and they're filling out a tax credit with a psychiatrist or a family doctor who realizes, you know, this condition has been in place for the last since they were 19. Um, so it might go back, you know, five years. So if the tax credit goes back five years, the tax tax credit refund will be for for five years, anywhere back up to 10 years. That's as far back as the government. Will where this is really important for the registered disability savings plan is that year of onset when a, the doctor puts in, um, you know, 2000 and, you know, 2019, 2012, 2008, you can go as far back as that tax credit year first began to go back and, and, and reclaim registered disability savings plan grants and bonds. And we're gonna see in a minute just what that would mean. So, so that's where the tax credit is, is extremely important. The problem with the tax credit is, in my mind, personally, with, with the people I talk to, it's almost more dependent upon the doctor than it is on the disability. And I have just, I, I know many, many people who get frustrated because their children show all the same symptoms and, and, and issues as somebody else who quite easily went through and got a tax credit and their doctor won't grant it. And um, some doctors are very skeptical about it. If you can if you can walk or talk or feed yourself, some doctors just are very reluctant to fill it out. Other doctors are very much advocates. Um, they're, they're advocates to the extent that, you know, this, this illness or this disability, I want to just admit somebody here, um, you know, it's, it, it impacts the livelihood of, of the person with whom is applying for it. it and it impacts them in various ways. So my first question, if I'm, if I'm looking at doing this at the start and I'm saying, um, you know, we're thinking getting the tax credit for my son or daughter or myself, well, what, I would just approach it with the practitioner and say, you know, we're, we're, we're thinking of getting the tax credit for my son, John. What, what do you think? You can probably gauge by their reaction um, how successful you'll be in getting that tax credit because Really, it's the doctors, most doctors are well aware what the tax credit is. They'll know the particular verbiage and whatnot that's required to get approved on the other end. What can be helpful for parents or for the person um, putting in the application is to add whatever information or along with the tax credit to the doctor practitioner. Some of them love it when you add information, um, you know, uh, periods of incarceration, periods of hospitalization, periods of, of being unable to go to school, being un unable to socialize. You're really kind of trying to paint a picture. On the other end, somebody at Revenue Canada is just sitting looking at this and it's really, what, what, does, yeah, what does this person's life look like? And that's, you want the tax credit application to kind of reflect that. 
Um, so those are conversations. I, I'm not going to get into it much, much more. But if you think it can, you know, can be a, sometimes psychiatrists are great. Sometimes they're too busy and they just won't even take the time. Sometimes family doctors may know the person's history much, much better because they've known an individual for many years. Um, so it, it asks the questions. There's there's no right or wrong answer to which time, which which practitioner is the best. If somebody absolutely runs again up to a brick wall, there are some organizations I think that are much better than others at um because they'll all charge a fee. I just don't like to see people pay money if they don't have to. So but but by all means email me, let me know. You may have your own own companies or firms in mind, but um there are some companies that will help you go through that process just by explaining your situation. But um, are there any questions? Oh, I guess you don't yeah, know. There, there is. I have a couple of questions. My son gets the disability tax credit. He didn't work much last year, but he's starting to work more this year. Can we claim the tax credit for last year and then he can claim it for this year? That's 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 what will typically happen. So. And for anybody, I will suggest to you when you fill out this form on page, it's on the second page, there's a box you can tick that says reassess all previous years. So if a doctor says, um, let's see, it was under you admit here. No. Um, if a doctor says, okay, this goes back seven or eight years and you tick that box, the government will automatically do it. So now, Ella, to your point, if the tax credit is transferred to, say, a parent, and then another year or two later, that child qualifies for the tax credit, but they are working. If they go above that personal limit, where the, the ta it'll always go to them first. So you don't even really have to worry about that because the tax credit is in their name. The government has their social insurance number. They will only transfer that credit to you or any money to you if the beneficiary can't use it. So if it's going to you in 2023, maybe even 2024, Suddenly in year 2025, um, this individual makes $25,000 because they're working, that tax credit will go to them automatically because that's, that's how the government will look at them. Doesn't mean you know it no longer gets transferred, but in that year, depending mm -hmm. on their income, they'll always go to the beneficiary first. What if the person with the disability doesn't want to cooperate? And, and that's, that's, that, is another, that is another problem. Um, some well think about it look at look at the name look at look at this look at the discussion we're having today we've got a registered disability savings we've got a disability tax credit some people i mean how many more times do they want to hear the word disability uh, and a lot of uh, and and it's, it's very understandable so a lot of individuals are so resistant towards that it's like being labeled or, or they're they just they don't want somebody they don't want they may not even believe there's anything wrong with themselves so it's really up to each parent or each caregiver how they're going to position that. A, there seem to be times when somebody's mental health may be worse or better than others. Those times where they may be more receptive is perhaps a better time to have that conversation. And B, if it can ever be explained to them how this will help them financially down the road. Um, and, I, and I've sometimes had, had conversations with the beneficiaries when the parents are having a hard time doing that just to try and articulate that this is what this will do for you. Because sometimes just understanding that monetary wise, this is going to benefit them tremendously. If that doesn't do it though, you know, that's, you've got to work on that because by all means that, that individual, um, you know, unless somebody has, has power turning over health is not going to be able to, to get a practitioner to really do this without them being involved in that process. We have another question. If ODSB is applied and approved, does DTC get get followed automatically, or should we apply for DTC yeah. so, separately? So, 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 and that's that's a, that's a good question. No, no, the the short answer is no. ODSP is is a provincial um, program. Uh, disability tax credit is federal because the the registered disability savings plan is a federal plan. So the two of them. Now, what I would suggest is if somebody has recently applied for ODSP that practitioner, a lot of the information will overlap. So it probably would be a good idea to go back to that same practitioner and say, we weren't aware of the disability tax credit would be very, very beneficial for our, our child. Could we please have that? Could you please fill that out as well? But the two of them are completely, completely separate and, and different. So 
I just have one okay. one more thing to just say on this subject. And that is, I'm getting lots of emails before the um, your talk about how people cannot get their doctors to uh, fill out the, um, the disability tax credit. And so I'm going to put in the um, chat. And if people sure. want to uh, email me, I put my email in the um, chat. But also, we had a speaker, Lemby Buchanan, uh, speak a while ago on her book she wrote a book on the accidental advocate and she has a site which i'm going to put on uh fighting for fairness uh, about the application appeal process to access the tax credit and she um uh, played a crucial role in reforming the income tax credit act to broaden the eligibility criteria for the disability tax credit to include psychiatric dis disorders and episodic disorders so I will put that in, but if anyone wants more information, um, you know, you can contact me and she has other resources as well that I have. Thank you. Okay, good. Um, okay, so now we're gonna move along. Now we're going to assume we're gonna say, okay, let's, even if it's been troublesome and it's taken some time, now we've got the tax credit approved. So now that we have the tax credit approved, what does the RDSP itself do? So, this is the, this is the, I'm gonna to talk to several different components of it. So the first part I'm gonna talk about is the disability savings. So for the disability savings grant, um, the government will match contributions. Your, uh, uh, the beneficiary up until December 31st of the year, somebody turns 49, they are eligible for grants and bonds, which is the next slide. The maximum lifetime savings grant is $70,000. The, the maximum grant in any given year is $3,500. And 95% of people will fall within this, this first, first line. So what this means is if your family net income, so somebody who is a minor, their family net income is they're living with their parents. Once you're 19 years old, regardless if somebody lives with their parents or not, family net income is their own. Or if they're married, if, if they have to be married, they have a spouse, it's included in that. So if their net income is below $106,000, 717, that, those are 2023 numbers. Of that 1,500 that you contribute for the first 500, you're gonna get 300%. For the second thousand, you're going to get 200%. So in other words, if somebody contributes $1,500, they're going to get $3,500 in grants in any given year. So when you see that maximum limit of $70,000, what that really amounts to is that if you did this 20 years in a row, say my child's, I don't know, 27 years old when I start this, and, and I go for, for 20 years at doing $500 or $1,500 a year, you would have contributed $30,000 of your own money to receive $70,000 of government grants. So the grants are very generous. The other thing to remember when I talked about the tax credit and being retroactive, if your tax credit was approved and it went back to the onset a number of years ago, you can then go start to try and reclaim all of those years. Um, the maximum the government will go back in any given year retroactively is $10,500, which is basically three years worth. So you know, you, if, you, if, it, if the tax credit goes back, eight, nine, 10 years, it's gonna take a number of years to catch up, but you can always go back and reclaim whatever you would have had just as if the plan was opened the year that your the beneficiary was eligible for the tax credit. And once you hit $70,000 in government grants, that's that's it for the grants. So that's up until age 49, at age, the year anybody turns 50, they're no longer eligible for, for the grants. So that's the grant portion of it. The second portion of it is what's called the CDSB, which is the Canada Disability Savings Bond. Same age criteria, you're eligible up until December 31st of the year you turn 49. Um, the lifetime limit for bonds is $20,000. The maximal annual bond is $1,000. The threshold's a little bit different here because for the bond, there's no contribution requirement. Um, so for example, in, in Guelph, where I live, you know, there's a number of of, of shelters or different different facilities and, and places where you know people will either be 
either be homeless or they're on housing. They have very little income. They have no, they have, they're completely estranged from family. So they have absolutely zero ability to contribute anything to any plan because there's no family member who can help. They at least, and, and there would be no reason for them to get a tax credit because they don't have any income that's gonna reduce their taxes. But simply by doing so, if their income is that low, they can at least over a lifetime get $20,000 of money they otherwise wouldn't have. But for anybody else, criteria is the same. Under $34,000 in, in family income, you'll get $1,000. If your net income is up to 53,000, it's gonna be prorated on that basis. And if you're over that amount, no benefit will be paid. So we saw what the grants are like. You've got, if you've contributed $30,000 over a lifetime, you've got $70,000 in grants. If you've, if you've done that same thing, you've got $20,000 in bonds. So what that really means is if you've put in $30,000, and I'm not talking about growth or anything, that's a whole different investment discussion, but you've put in 30, the government's put in 70 and 20, grants and bonds. So now you've got $120,000. You're basically buying a dollar for a quarter. That's what the RDSP, and that's, this, this graph is a little bit maybe confusing, but the, the, the whole point of this is that um, when I look at that area on the blue, that blue shaded area, um, if you look at a, an individual who has a career, maybe they've got kids, they're working, they're getting a pension, their savings, that purple line, for a lot of people starts off very slowly. And by the time they're 55 or 60, you know, that's when they've accumulated capital to retire. And that's what they find. Then they use that financial capital, they create a retirement plan. And that's the money that's drawn down so they can they can meet their retirement goals throughout the course of time. But that blue area, while they're not saving, you know, they're investing, they're, they're paying a mortgage, they're paying into insurance policies, they're paying into pension plans. They're doing things to save money to create that pool of money later. An individual with, with disability, even if it's on and off and it's sporadic, is often extremely difficult to generate savings whatsoever. Um, quite often employment either just doesn't happen or if it does, it, it's not long enough to create any kind of a pension. Um, there's often not enough ability to, to create savings, be it TFSAs or anything else. So they, they get to that retirement stage at, at 65 and, and there's really you know, nothing at that point they can do. They don't have the capital to, to live off. So that's really, when you look at that buying a dollar for a quarter and, and that money that was put into this plan, the disability plan is set up more or less to kind of create a pension for that person. And that's, and that's, that's how it was um, really designed. So that's really what it's trying to do is equal the playing field. And that's really the, the whole purpose of, of a registered disability savings plan in terms of the grants and bonds. So that's, um, again, that's maybe a little confusing, but the whole point being is, is that it, it's trying to equal that, um, give them the capacity to do what they otherwise wouldn't have been able to do. Um, and you'd say, okay, well, how are, um, how are these, how are these taxed? So we've put, um, like if you, if you buy, if you put money into an RSP, for example, many people listening here have, have RSPs or, or, or drawing from RSPs. You, you put money into your RSP and many people do it because their income is high enough. They want that tax. They want to reduce the taxes they pay. Um, when they pull the RSP out, they're paying tax on everything because they got a tax break putting it all in. With an RDSP, the only part that won't be taxed is your original contribution because that's after tax money. So that would be double taxation. So over the course of time, you've put in $30,000 of your own money just to get the grants and bonds. That will never be taxed. But whatever the government gave an individual in terms of of grants in terms of bonds and whatever growth was in the plan that will be taxed. Um, so that's just to be aware, that's that's how the taxation part of it works. Um, what will happen though is, and I'm gonna talk about the vesting period in a minute. If, if, this, if this money doesn't really get used until later on, then whoever be it being a, the account holder or the beneficiary themselves, they're starting to withdraw money from this plan down the road then you do tax planning just like anybody else would with their own investments. At, at that point in time, it, it's all, you, you want to make tax efficient decisions. For this individual, there's gonna be a personal tax credit already in place of, you know, if it's today, you're looking at 
13, 14 thousand dollars plus a disability tax credit that's going to take your income up over 20, 22 thousand dollars. And then you're to 65 and you've got an age credit. So there's a lot of income you, there's a lot of income you can generate without paying tax on anyway. So even though the cumulative total looks pretty high and all taxable, it can be drawn out in such a way that very little tax can be paid on it. But it's always good just to make people aware that, you know, some of this, a good portion of this will be taxable as you go along. Um, impact on social assistance benefits. This, I'll, I'll typically get this question. Um, you know, somebody had already mentioned ODSP and going through that process. So anything from an RDSP, from a registered disability savings plan, will have no impact in on any other government benefit. So in on this this happened the, the, like as soon as this plan came out, um, eight out of the ten provinces immediately said this. I they, they might all be on board now, and in Ontario it always has been BC. Most of the, the people I deal with. Um, so if somebody turns sixty five years old, they've got money in an RDSP. Jesus, is that going to affect my my income supplement? No, it won't. Will it affect CPP? No, it won't. Well, as you go along. I've got two hundred thousand dollars in an RDSP. That must mean I won't get the good, the, the GST benefit. It won't affect that. And most importantly, the thing people most worry about is what will it do to my ODSP. So any money either withdrawn or any money sitting inside of an RDSP will have no impact on ODSP because ODSP has certain thresholds. You can have up to forty thousand dollars in in a bank. Used to be five for many, many years, and all at once they jumped from five to 40 about five years ago. Um, if you're on ODSP, you can have certain things that you can you can own a, a vehicle, you can own a property. Oh, excuse me. Um, but other things will affect ODSP, and, and you, you could lose your benefits. RDSP is not one of them. So nobody ever has to worry about an RDSP having any impact on any of the other benefits they get from the, the government. Um, this is extremely important to be aware of is that there is a 10 year vesting period for grants and bonds. Um, currently, what that means is that as long as I have an RDSP open or a plan open, um, until the government stops giving me money, so if I've reached that threshold, the 20 years where I've got 70,000 and 30,000, that might be, okay, that's, that's, that's year one, that's T1 of my 10. So that's when I talked about the government really designing this to be a pension. That's kind of what it what this means. So if somebody opens up a plan, you know, in December of 2000 of this year, and they put in $3,500 because the tax credit went way back, and the government gives them 10,500 in grants, you know, January 2nd of the following year, you can't pull all that money out and go on a cruise or a holiday, because it'll all go back. Anything the government gave you will go back. So keep that in mind that this is really a long-term planning pension type product. That, that's what it's designed for. Um, a lot of people have an issue with that. Um, there may be some changes to that moving forward, whereby once the 10 years of contributions of the first contribution is up, you can start using that money. At this point, that hasn't changed. So, so just be really aware of it. That, that's why a lot of parents, for example, will get things like insurance and whatnot just in case something happens before that time where the child can actually use the grants and use the RDSP. Because if something happens to them and they have to withdraw the money from the plan and the money has to go back to the government, it kind of defeats the purpose of what they were doing in the first place. Another question I'll often get is, okay, I'm after age 49, um, I mean, what, what's, is there any value in contributing? If you remember the very first slide, it said you can open up a plan until December 31st of the year you turn 59. Then the very next couple of slides, we looked at all these wonderful grants and bonds, but they all stopped at age 49. So is there a benefit after age 49? So when my father died in 1991, um, my brother or sister and I each got either, it was like 45, $50,000, something, something in that, in that vicinity. So my brother put his money in the bank and he was cut off of ODSP immediately because he he, he had more than 5,000 was the limit at the time. And in, until his 
money in the bank came down below five thousand dollars his benefits stopped and then once he got there then he was back on again my sister in 91 she with my mom's help my decided to get a condominium in um in the west mall in etobicoke um, so she bought a condominium well she bought part of a condominium and my mom bought the rep but between the two of them they had this condominium uh, it was my my sister was part owner of the principal residence so ODSP didn't skip a beat. She had her she had her money invested into a condo, and about seven or eight years ago, she was in her fifties, so she was no longer eligible for for grants or bonds with Mary DSP. But she was no longer capable of living in her condo anymore, just managing them. So, so she sold the condo between what she put in and, and growth and equity. There's now like seventy two, seventy three thousand dollars. That she has that once she once her property closes, she's now going to have that money go to her bank account. She's under the age of fifty nine, so within you know, that money going into the bank within the next day, it was into an RDSP. ODSP never skipped a beat. So it's extremely valuable for anybody over the age of forty nine who might get an inheritance. Um, uh, they you know I'll, I'll get this um, you know, I'll get these questions all the time from people who. Um, you know, families, maybe they didn't set up trusts or something didn't happen like that. But if they're under that age of 60, they can still at least, the RDSP will, will be put in and everything else can run seamlessly. But here's, here's probably the most underutilized, in my mind as an advisor, uh, tax strategy that I see from an estate. So for everybody, everybody should have an exit strategy for their rent. So you're, you've, 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 and I'm not talking about your child now, I'm talking about Parents, they're going along. They put money into RSPs. They've they're 71 now. The year you turn 72, you can no longer have a have an RSP. It turns into a RIF, and you now have a RIF. And if you, a lot of people just don't like paying tax on it because they say I don't want to pull out more than the RIF minimum because I'm going to pay tax. And if I pay tax, it's um, the more I take out, the more tax I'm going to pay. If you don't have a strategy to get rid of your RIF, then the government has one for you. And I guarantee you it's not as good as something you can come up with. Because when you pass away, I mean, you can roll that to your spouse, but the number of spouses whose second spouse passing away with two, three, four hundred thousand dollars in a RIF is, is staggering. That is all treated in the income in the year of death. So you might not have wanted to pay 35, 40% as you went along, but the government's going to take 50% or more the year you die. So all you've done is take away money that would have gone to your estate otherwise. So, so it's really, everybody should have an exit strategy. Where the DTC comes in and where this is especially valuable to estates is that if you have a child with a disability tax credit, so my mom, for example, either one of my brother or sister, upon death, registered assets like a RIF, if they don't go to the estate, they can go roll over to that child and go into their own RIFs or RSPs without being taxed at the estate level. Then they pull money out just like somebody else would, and you're paying far, far less tax on it. It's probably the, the number one strategy that can save uh, an estate a lot of money and put more money in your children's hands. And that's a, and, and then it becomes a, 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 an estate planning process with your lawyer, with your will, equalizing assets, so on and so forth. But there... And I just say this to keep in mind, a lot of people will be working with advisors, ask that question or, or look, explore, explore that option because you may not, or your advisor may not even be aware that you can do something like this. So it's, and whether or not it's appropriate for whoever's, I, I have no idea, but more often than not, people just aren't aware of it. And there are things you can do that will, will help. Um, the other thing I, I should mention, that, that RDSP, I said at age 49, you no longer got grants and bonds. Um, at age 59 was the year, if you remember, that's the last year you could open up a plan. At age 60, that's when you have to start pulling money from an RDSP. So again, when I go back to that example of an RSP and a RIF, where at age 72, it becomes a retirement income fund and you have no choice but to start pulling out the minimum and then gradually going higher, that percentage increases each year. An RDSP does exactly the same thing. Um, so at age 60, there's it's, it's called a lifetime disability assistance payment. It will start at a percentage and every year that percentage will increase. 
There's also the ability to pull out one-time um, lump sums, uh, a, a disability assistant payment. I don't want to get too much into the withdrawal at this point because I'm, I'm more concerned about just the planning process to try and accumulate money and create capital. But at age 60, just be aware that that's, that's what will happen with, with, an, with a, an RDSP. Um, and, and somebody will say, well, you know, is there, is there anything else I can do? Um, maybe I have an RDSP for my child and I'm putting in the, the maximum to get grants and bonds right now. Um, but you know, they, it, it's all, if there's a vesting period, so they can't really, can't really utilize this. Um, another, another option or another commonly used solution, well, not commonly used, but because a lot of ODSP officers aren't even aware of it when I, when I do this with clients is one of the exempt assets within ODSP is something called a, the cash value of a life insurance policy. It's under one of the ODSP directors. Segregated funds fall within that category. A segregated fund is virtually almost exactly the same as a mutual fund, but it can only be purchased through an insurance company. So here's a great example. Somebody, somebody doesn't, say, say somebody's coming along and they, they don't even have a tax credit. Um, and they they okay now I've got I've got fifty thousand dollars here. Uncle Joe gave me some money, and I'm going to be cut off ODSP if I don't have if I don't have the if I don't have an RDSP because where else can I put this money? You can put up to a hundred thousand dollars into a, a segregated fund. Um, the beneficiary of an RDSP, I have many of them who are running segregated funds along with their their RDSP because a segregated fund they will use to kind of supplement their income. You can with ODSP directives take up about, up to $10,000 annually at this point. So they'll supplement their income in this way. So there are there are other, other opportunities to, to shelter money and protect ODSP that a lot of people just, just aren't aware of. And, and that will be applicable for some people and, and for others it won't, but it's well worth just understanding that, you know, whatever the situation, there, there might be something else somebody can do if they run into to troubles with respect to protecting Benefits. Are there any questions there, Joni, before I carry on? Someone was saying, also wondering if having existing R RSP impacts RDSP. I think you answered that. I'm not sure. Uh, no, I haven't answered that, but okay. I'll tell you what What I I, I will answer that here because you've stumbled across a lot of people have... <laughs> I, I Somebody who gets injured, for example, I'll do a lot of work with the, the Ontario Spinal Cord Injury as well, I'll, I'll go down to Hamilton or or in, in in Toronto, and I've done the odd workshop there. There, that's a different. There, you get a lot of people, for example, who might have their disability onset is is partway through a working career where an accident happens. People have RSPs, and they um, everybody assumes an RSP is for retire. An RSP is just a tax vehicle. So if somebody who somebody has an RSP, A, yes, you can certainly have an RDSP, but B, more importantly, pull out whatever you can from that RSP every single year that you can up to the maximum to benefit to, to, to benefit every single tax credit available. If you can pull money out and not be taxed on it, you can literally drain RSPs and never pay a cent of tax on them. So I've I've got some clients who will have that in it they'll pull money out of an RSP and then somebody will say, yeah, but that's income and ODSP may look at that and treat it as income and it could jeopardize my benefits. If ODSP is aware that money is coming from an RSP to directly fund another asset that's exempt, like an RDSP, then by all means do that. So yes, you can have both. B, depending on your situation, really take a look at that RSP and what you're even doing with it and if it even makes sense. Because many people keep RSPs because they think, I've got to keep it till I retire. And they could have dissolved it long ago without ever paying any tax on it. And then it's too late later on because now you've got taxable income with, with old age security and so on and so forth. Um, sorry, any uh, another question, Joni? Yes. Um, how does CRA distinguish between the 30,000 original money you can contribute to RDSP and the growth of the whole RDSP? as you start withdrawing money each year over multiple years. Okay, they'll just, there's just a formula that they'll use. They'll take, they'll take a percentage of contributions versus a percentage of the, the 
government grants and bonds, and then you'll get a T slip. So while the RDSP is growing, nobody's going to get a tax slip for this. So it's, it's very similar to an RSP in that that respect. It grows it it grows tax exempt until such time as you actually do start withdrawing it. I'm going to admit somebody else. Um, so yeah, the, it, that will all be laid out by the government, but they'll accommodate for the money that was put in. So thirty thousand, if somebody just went that route, but if somebody later on from either an estate wise or even before that. There are people who have, there are affluent individuals who have money that is going to be earmarked for their child anyway. So instead of their paying them paying tax on it all the way through their life, they would rather fund you know up to 200,000 into an RDSP so that it grows tax deferred. And it just, it, it can make a tremendous difference on the amount of money that will be in the plan. But if, so if somebody's put in $200,000, obviously that ratio is far higher for the contribution so that, but that will all get, CRA will work through that because based on the beneficiary, based on their social insurance number and based on the RDSP plan, they'll be able to tell exactly what is income, what is growth, what is government grant and bond, very similar to what an RDSP would do. Um, so that, that will all get calculated based on the different formulas the government has. And they'll tell exactly, they can tell exactly which is which. Um, Okay, sure. this is a this is a two part question. Does RDSP have a contribution room uh, on its own, separate from RSP, RSP or pension? Yeah, so that, uh, an RS an R, RSP is a completely different animal. The RDSP has that two hundred thousand dollar contribution. Somebody doesn't need a tax credit or an, an RSP. Anybody can open one if it makes sense from a tax perspective. You go ahead and do it. An RDSP and an RSP are, are not related whatsoever. Um, you can't roll an RSP into an RDSP. Um, what you can do at some point down the road is if, if a parent has created an RS, or ESP for a child, or education registered educational savings plan, and they end up not going to school because maybe a disability has, has affected their ability to do so, that money that would normally be taxed to the parents because of the growth and whatnot, that can roll over. And so there are ways you can roll some RESP money into an RDSP. Again, that's very specific, but um, if somebody's in that situation, feel free to just send me an email and ask me. I don't want, I don't want to complicate. There's so many different avenues we could go down that I don't want to get, get too complicated in this. Okay. The next part of this question is if an account holder of an RDSP uh, brackets caregiver dies. How are the fund? How the funds will be passed to the beneficiary? Okay, so if the if the account holder dies, the RDSP remains in effect. If the beneficiary dies, that's the RDSP has to close December thirty first of the following year on death. But let's talk about the account holder. So that's why. Um, Quite often it'll be parents, it might be a joint account where the, the surviving parent becomes the account holder. Sometimes the individual who's the beneficiary over a course of time may, may have the capacity or may be more able to manage their own plan. Failing that, um, that's, why, that's why now based, based on rules recently introduced by the government, a sibling can now be the account holder for an RDSP. So the account holder can change within a plan um, based on the the, you know, the approval of whoever's the existing account holders. And if worse came to worst and all else failed, um, you know, it'd probably be taken over by a public guardian and trustee. What wouldn't happen is the, the account wouldn't close because the account holder died. The account holder has nothing to do with the um, viability of the RDSP. They're only there to manage it on that person's behalf. So if they can't, somebody else will. Most people preferably would not have a public guardian managing their child's account. So they will, you know, some people go to the extreme and, and create guardianship. Um, so, so there are different ways, but try and address that as you, as you go along and think, okay, once we're gone, who is going to be managing this or the account holder to take, to take over for, for our child. But um but yeah, it, it won't it won't close the plan itself. That's that's only if something happens to the beneficiary. Okay, the, the next uh, question, um, I think we answered this. Is there a maximum income that allows someone 
to apply for RDSP? What if your loved one is capable of, of a low income job, like working at Starbucks? Yeah, we looked at the threshold, right? If you yeah. um, yeah. if you have a up to hundred thousand dollars, you're not going to have hundred thousand dollars a year working at Starbucks. If you go over that thirty four thousand dollar threshold, then you might not get the bond. But I mean, there are there are I've got I've got police officers who are clients who are um, you know they might they might have have a tax credit because of PTSD. Their their income is well over the level, especially with their family income of that 107,000, they still get the 100%, they still get the the matching 100% grant every year based on a thousand dollar contribution. So the threshold will affect if you get to a high level, the amount of grants you'll get, but it will never affect the the tax credit or the, the RDSP itself. Okay. And the last question is, um, my son, uh, has worked in worked uh, in the professional capacity uh, until he became unwell, um, and he has a long term disability uh, pension uh, and, and receiving long uh, long um, sorry um, disability pensions from his work. Can he apply to some of these other um, tax credits? Oh, one hundred percent. What he probably wouldn't qualify for is, is something like ODSP because he has because he has a source of income. Um, but but can he qualify for the tax credit, the RDSP? Absolutely, um, because those those have nothing to do with each other. So so yes, shorter answer is he absolutely he can, and he may even he may not even have any taxable. Every every employer insurance company is different based on what LTD or long term disability looks like. Some plans, sometimes it's taxable, sometimes it isn't. You'd have to look at your plan itself or talk to your HR department and see, but that will have no bearing on whether or not you can qualify for the tax credit. So I've got, I've got plenty of clients who have the tax credit and their DSPs and are collecting long-term disability and probably will be for another 10, 15, 20 years. And that doesn't affect their pension as well, right? Oh, that well, this will, this will have no, no effect whatsoever on their their pension with from the from the insurer. No. Okay, great. Those are all the questions so far. Thank you. Okay. So so when I talk about protecting ODSP, we talk about you know Henson Trust or, or sorry segregated fund is something somebody they might use. The RDSP we now are aware that that will never affect it. What parents are quite often most concerned about is okay, what happens when I pass away? Now I pass away and my say I've got. I've got three kids, I don't know, two of whom maybe are, have careers or married, they've got children, and one of whom might have a disability. Say, um, you know, I would like my estate, most people might, for, for sake of argument, say I'm just going to, simple simple will says I want to divide things equally, three ways. And um, so if, you, if you've got $900,000 in your estate when you pass away in between your property and investments and whatnot, everybody gets $300,000, the child who is on ODSP is going to be immediately cut off. So when, when you hear the word Henson Trust, this is typically what it refers to. This is this is why people will get Henson Trust. Um, and here's here's more or less what um, what it does. So first of all, I mean everybody should have a will. If you don't, you die. A will's intestate and it goes through the courts and they will determine based on the jurisdiction and the province who gets what. So a will just simplifies exactly what will happen with one's money. When you have a child with, with a, a disability, or especially if you're worried about, and it's not just ODSP to payments, and more often than not, it's just as much the medication that goes with it, which would be very, very expensive if it wasn't covered by the disability benefit, the, the Ontario Disability Support Plan. So, so they'll sit and talk to people and say, well, I've heard of Henson Trust. What exactly is a Henson Trust? First of all, I will reference um, on that website that Joni uh, mentioned at the beginning, the home of the RDSP.ca. If you go, if you're on that website and you go to the estate planning section, you'll see about a 20 minute interview I have with Frank Valeriat. He's a lawyer in Guelph. Frank was an MP actually when, when the RDSP came into effect back in 2008. Now he's left politics and he's back practicing law again. 
But as a lawyer, I have this discussion with them. So if you're not quite sure what a Henson Trust is um, and you want to invest 20 minutes of your time, go on the website and watch that, um, watch that video. Then you'll hear it from a lawyer's perspective as well. Because again, I'm not giving legal advice. I'm just kind of giving you some general ideas of what a Henson Trust is. The reason it's valid is because a Henson Trust is, it, it's called discretionary. What that means is it's, com it's completely discretionary up to the trustee, the person who's managing the money. So uh, a trust will have what's called a settler. Settler are the people who create the trust. Quite often it's a couple. And maybe one couple passes away and the second one's there. And when they pass away, that's when the, you know, they can create the trust well in advance, but it's, it's more often than not funded until such time as they pass away. And when they do, they, they put that money, say, I wanna put the money for my, my one child, like my mom has done for, for example, for my brother and sister, I wanna put that into a, a Henson Trust so that A, it, it doesn't affect their benefits, ODSP, if they're still under age 65, or more importantly, quite often is so that you know, they, they don't have the ability to, to do something that will sabotage that trust. And that could be any one of a number of things. If it, my brother, for example, if he if he got you know a hundred thousand dollars tomorrow and somebody gave it to him and he went downtown and he went to Young and Dundas and walked up to Bluer, he would find enough people who needed it more than him by the time he got to Bluer and his money would be so that's not what my mom would like to intend it to happen with his money. She wants it used for the purposes that he needs it throughout you know the rest of his life. So that is what the trustee has the discretion to be able to do. And that's why that's why the money's that's why ODSP will look at a Henson Trust and say, okay, it 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 doesn't vest in the name of the beneficiary. That's why it doesn't affect ODSP. Because quite honestly, the trustee, because it's discretionary, can use this trust for whatever they want. Um, so you better, when you're having conversations with your lawyer and even with yourselves before you see a lawyer. That's a really critical piece. Who is, and I talk about that in a minute, who's going to be the trustee? And, and I talk next about that. That's why, that's why the money won't affect the, the ODSP benefits generally. This, this actually all started in Guelph with um, a young woman by the name of Audrey Henson uh, who passed away and her father created a trust in community living was the trustee. And ODSP cut Audrey off of benefits because they said, well, you've got all this money and you've got more money than you're allowed. And community living was a trustee. The lawyer went to the Supreme to they went to the Supreme Court, the, the Ontario Supreme Court, and they overturned it. And they said, no, that's not Audrey's money because the trust doesn't sit with her. She doesn't have the ability to go pull money out. It's it's up to the discretion of the trustee. That's where the name Henson Trust comes from. That was simply the case that that had the Henson Trust in it. Different lawyers will call it different things, but primarily it's a discretionary trust. Selecting the trustee, from my experience, is the really important piece for a family. Um, so when my mom set hers up originally, and, and this is what a lot of people do. Say you've got two or three children and one has a disability or two does and one doesn't. Just almost by default, it's like, okay, well, I'll name my, my other child the They'll be the trustee because you know it's it's easy. They're a family member, and so on and so forth. So um, so that's what my mom had done. Um, and about eight or nine years ago, I was going to my mom's for dinner in Oakville. And on my way to dinner, and then I, I I got there, and my brother was kind of beaten up and bruised. And when he was on his way at the park across the street to where she lives, as he was cutting through the field a bunch of teenagers duct tape them to a pole just for kicks. They thought it would be fun because this guy's a vulnerable guy. My brother, who was, you know, he would have been his early 50s at the time, um, probably weighs 135 pounds soaking wet right now. Back when, when his, his last year of junior hockey, when he played at St. Mike's on, um, on the junior team, he was the Eastern Conference first center all-star, the second center all-star went on to gain notoriety wearing number 99. So that's the level of hockey my brother played. And he was probably 195 pounds of solid muscle. And, you know, he's, this illness had, had deteriorated his body to the point where he, 
he's out there. Now he's a frail guy and he's over at my limbs. He's duct taped to a thing. I was livid and I was ready to kill somebody. And I, I talked to my brother and he, he says, you know, they're just a bunch of teenagers and they don't know what they're doing. And I mean, A, I probably learned more about forgiveness from him that day than I've ever learned for anybody. But the other thing I did, I talked to my mom and the next morning I said, you have to change your will. And I said, what do you mean I have to change my will? We've just gone through all of this and we've set it up and we've got a trust. I said, I said, you know what? I don't want to be the guy telling my brother, Kenny, and my sister, Patty. I don't want to be telling them when they can and can't have money the rest of their lives when you're gone. I'd rather just be a brother. Um, so in that case, we got a corporate trustee through through BMO Trust, where um, you know who she had banked with, and, and and I and I knew one of the the trustee officers from some of the seminars I'd done. But in that case, it it fit to have a a corporate trustee. In other cases, siblings are perfectly fine. But the point is, give some thought before you just arbitrarily pick somebody because it's a family member or whatever. Because I. And you've probably experienced money will rip families apart like nothing else. I know families to this day who siblings won't talk to each other because one of them was named executor to their parents' estate 10 years ago, 20 years ago, and they took more fees than the other ones thought they would take. And money does crazy things. So if in the interest of, you know, keeping family harmony, you think it might be a better idea to do something different, then, then do that, or at least think about it. Um, so that's, a, I, I, I just, again, not being a lawyer and telling you what to do with a trust, think of these things before you go in and have that conversation with the lawyer. Who else could be trustee? And, and again, sometimes, sometimes uh, the relationship between the siblings is wonderful and it's perfectly fine. But in many cases, it's only done kind of by default. So before you do that, I, I would encourage anybody to, to really give that part some, some thought. Um, questions, anything before I go along? Yes, there are. What is the advantage of a Hanson Trust versus a privately set up trust? Well, a Hanson, a Hanson Trust is just simply discretionary. What a privately, uh, any, any trust, if you set it up as discretionary trust, again, it's not the Hanson part. It's only, that's only kind of the, the name that it's been given because of that. So, so people will use trust for various, various reasons. Um, but the, the Henson trust, that discretionary part is, is simply the, the part that will um, allow you to, to protect your child from, from OD, from getting ODSP impact. The other part that it does, and this is a, this is extremely important for an executor to remember or somebody who's managing the trust. If, if somebody, what happened with trust Trust used to be extremely popular up until 2016. Business trusts, all kinds of trusts were taxed. At that point in time, they changed the entire nature of the way trusts were taxed. Now trusts are taxed at the highest personal tax rate as opposed to a graduated rate. However, one of the, one of the exceptions is if an individual qualifies for the disability tax credit. So for example, my brother and sister, when my mom passes away and have a have a have a trust because they have a disability tax credit in place. They can make that election. The, the executor, whoever the trustee, whoever's filing the taxes, will will note that they're DTC eligible. Then it will be a graduated tax rate, just like it it normally would be. So what it would be for somebody's personal tax rate, what it used to be prior to 2016. So that's that's one reason a to make sure that a, the trustee that's another big advantage or, or important consideration is make sure they understand all of these aspects that because the trust is kind of its own legal entity it's going to have to file a tax return each year so they need to know that it has to do that the, the trustee should know okay how, how much what's ODSP like how much how am I giving money out what will it affect benefits like they they need to be aware of all the different nuances and and other different areas that it could affect an individual's financial well-being. Um, that whole part we talked about with the um, with RIFs and the potential rollovers to, to a child and maybe equalizing the rest of the estate so that you save your estate a whole bunch of tax money, that's something the executive would do. What I like to do with families and um, 
it doesn't happen all the time, but if I've got a couple who have two or three children and everybody's involved and they, they, they can all have a frank discussion, it's really nice to get an entire family together well in advance of whatever is gonna to happen to their parents. Although that could happen tomorrow, as we all understand. That's why you set these things up, just in case something does happen tomorrow. But then when the time comes, everybody kind of has an idea Here's what's going to happen. They're not going to remember the details of what needs to be done, but they'll remember, oh, there are some tax things we can do. We've got to make sure we, we use that disability tax credit election. We might be able to roll over registered assets. If everybody has an understanding of how things are going to go well in advance, it just um, I find it's extremely beneficial to, for, for them to have that relationship and, and, and do those things before. So when you're having that, you know, who's going to butcher it? Don't let the trustee find out they're going to be a trustee after you've passed away. Oh, by the way, it's in your will. Did you know you're now the trustee for your brother or sister? What does that mean? Um, and that happens more than you, you would think. So those discussions are good to have well in advance. Um, anyway, sorry, I might have gotten off track a bit, but did you have another question, Joni? Yeah, there's a couple more. And, you know, that's a big, uh, that's a big point because... Um, uh, I've had this discussion with some other people and they're saying, do not have your um, your other sibling or family members be um, a trustee. And, and I did that. So I have to rethink that because it may not be great for the future, but some people- And, and it may not, but, it, but it, it might be. There are, and I know many families where the person with the disability is, they have a, a fabulous relationship. But if you do go a different route, understand that a sibling can still kind of be involved even at arm's length. So for example, a corporate trustee, you know, if they know the trustee themselves and they, and they know them personally, they don't have any legal bearing on what happens with the money, but they understand what's going on in their sibling's life. Look, trustee, you can expect a call from you know, Frank or Joe sometime in the next couple of weeks because they're kind of off right now and, and they'll, have a, they'll have a good sense of what, what their life looks like and, they can kind of help even if they're not the trustee itself. But but again, that, that doesn't mean for everybody to don't have a family member because it, it can work out great. The advantage of a family obviously is they know the person better than anybody and what's going on in their life. But it's only if it's really going to tarnish that relationship, you might want to really give it some thought. Okay, there's two more questions. My brother turned 60 in, De in December, 2024. Can I apply for his disability tax credit now and go back 10 years? Uh, yeah, absolutely. You can't go back 10 years. It's, that's up to the doctor. So when you apply for the tax credit, all you do is you, on your brother's, that goes into the practitioner. It's the practitioner that notes when the onset was, not, not the individual applying for the tax credit. The next question is, I have an RDSP, but have limited options for investments. Are there platforms to trade directly on the markets where the account holder can have access to the same trading ability as, as an RSP or a TFSA? Um, yeah, just talk to TD is probably the most common one where you can you know, um, have your own plan. And, and not everybody has the wherewithal or ability to to do that or or even the desire to do that but there are i mean every every bank or institution i i personally for my for my rdsps i almost always use mckenzie financial and the reason i do that is because their vp of trust and estate planning i can reach with a phone call and she's on the advisory board to the government so i'd like to have a personal relationship with the firm that's managing the rdsp but if it's the investment portion you're really keen on and talk to different institutions and see which one has the ability to do that. So, but that by all means, that every, every, every institution is different on kind of the platforms or the, the, you know, what they offer. So, so that's just, that's just simply a matter of asking around. And our DSPs can always be transferred by the way, just like any other registered plan, uh, an RSP, a TFSA, there are, you know, you can, you can sign a registered form that will just, it's its portable. You can only have one, as I mentioned in the beginning, but somebody doesn't like the institution they're with and they want to move it to another advisor or another institution, by all means, you can do that. Thank you. There's no more questions in the chat. Okay, because I think we're pretty well approaching the end anyway. Okay. Um, 
we've talked about trust, we've talked about trustees. So, you know, when the planning process, and many of you have probably already done this, and, and some of you maybe not, but, um, you know, when you're looking at that and looking at the situation, that's where I talk about trying to get your whole family involved. That's where I talk about your own taxation, what you're doing in your own retire retirement and looking at your child with a disability, you know, in, 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 in place number two there, what, what strategies might you adopt that are maybe unique to your situation that somebody else might not be able to do? Um, I'm admitting somebody I'm pretty well over, but anyway. Um, so these are, these are conversations I wanna have with your advisor. Um, you, the, I can't emphasize enough the estate planning considerations and all of those different different aspects, and it really becomes congruent with what you're doing yourself. Because if there if there are tax benefits to doing something differently than what you already have in place, that's going to affect how you're currently drawing income, so on and so forth. So that's beyond the scope of what I'm going to talk about here, but it's a really important piece to sit down and, and talk to your advisor about. Um, you know, then, then you just, you, you lay out all of those different things and situations and an, an advisor who understands this stuff is going to put in recommendations and you, you sit and look at that. And that's, that's really how you implement a plan. But I, I never look at them as kind of separate. Well, here, here's my son's stuff or my daughter's stuff over here. And this is what we're doing. And, you know, once we're gone, that'll be taken care of. There are many things that will overlap that you may be missing out on. So those are those are things I would certainly encourage you to take a look at or or talk to your advisor about if you're if you're working on some of these things. Um, again, that's anybody has any questions and there's my email address. Feel free to, um, to email me or or call me. I'm you know I'll I'll gladly you know point you in the right direction or give you a quick answer. Some people do want to have a discussion, a more thorough one. That's that, that's fine. But um, Really, this hopefully you've gotten something out of this that gives you a, a better idea of some aspect of whatever you're trying to do that gives you a little bit of clarity, maybe in in which direction to go. Or, you know, like I said at the beginning, a lot of it. If nobody is in a situation where we haven't done anything and it's all overwhelming, because there's a lot of stuff we've talked about. That's why I don't want to carry on and go into any more detail about investment types and things of that nature just even what we've talked about here and maybe the next step for you, yeah, you know what, we really, we really need to set up a trust or yeah, I should really talk about to my practitioner about getting that tax credit in or whatever, whatever, or I should talk to my son or daughter and explain what a trustee does and do they think that would work well for them or wouldn't work well for them. Pick something and then just kind of approach it that way. And then um, you'll kind of be moving forward. That's in, in my experience. Anyway, that's what, that was works well for people because there's a lot going on. And I've talked about it at the beginning, the, the emotional impact and things happen and it just becomes really hard to try and do everything. So while you, while you can, um, you know, do what you do what you can. And again, any questions, let me know. Um, I think that's about it from the presentation side, Joni. I have some other questions here. Um, okay. What happened? What happens to a hints and trust when a person turns 65 and ODSB ends? Okay, so a hints and trust, a hints and trust will still be in place. So, so if, if if somebody has money sitting inside a hints and trust, the trust, the trustee then has the ability, if when I said it was a discretionary trust, so let's say one of the parents' directives was, you know what, we want to keep this trust in place because it's really important that our child maintain all their ODSP benefits. And now that they've turned 65, what happens with ODSP will typically end at 65, then an individual will get, will get old age security, and more often than not, if they don't have any other income, they'll get the guaranteed income supplement. So their income will go right back to basically where it was with ODSP. But you don't have those stipulations anymore. So the trustee may start to give out far more money to the beneficiary. They may give out, depending on what how they can manage it, um, they, they could give them all the money. They could just continue to, if the primary purpose of the trust was because, you know, we want to protect our child um, from, you know, things we talked about, my brother, the case of giving away money, somebody else, it might be a, a predatory relationship. They, um, you know, they've got this money 
Same, same with the property, by the way. I should have mentioned this. When, I, when you talk about a trust, a trust can hold anything. So a lot of parents will think, well, geez, I'd love to buy my child a, a, a condo or something before I'm gone because I want to see them living independently. Um, you do that and you buy the condo for your child. That, that's now their property. So what a lot of people will do or can do is you can hold that in a trust because then the child, the child will live there. The trustee, just like any other part of a trust, will kind of manage it. But what it, what it won't do, it won't give them the ability to wake up tomorrow morning and say, well, I'm going to sell my condo because I want the money. Um, so again, that, that trustee is really important because they should understand exactly what the settlers, the, the parents, whoever created the trust, what were their intentions? If the primary intention was protect ODSP, but otherwise that person is more than capable of managing their own money, there is nothing to stop the trustee from giving them the money. Or so, so it's it changes it, it it changes in ODSTP terms, but it doesn't change with respect to the trustee. If it's a Henson Trust, still has complete discretion over what happens, and they should really be doing what the parents would have probably wanted to do if the parents were still there. My son has money in his TFSA over forty thousand dollars, so I don't think he qualified for the ODSP on his first try. Remember what I mentioned about segregated funds. Segregated funds, you can have up to $100,000 in a segregated fund. And I, because I get people like this all the time, I have too much money for ODSP. Within five minutes, you can solve that problem. You don't need to have a, you don't need a tax credit in place. Now you've got money that's no longer considered an asset in terms of ODSP. You're below the $40,000 threshold and away you go. So your, your son would be a perfect example of somebody who would benefit tremendously from just getting a segregated fund. So I'll talk to an advisor who has an insurance license and he can go to an insurance company and open up an, a, a segregated fund. There's a, that's, that's what I would suggest. Um, if that's the inhibiting factor, it doesn't need to be. Uh, the next question, if the family members find that the trustee situation causes, creates problems, can they pass the role onto a corporate trustee? There is now the ability with, um, I think it's fairly recent change in, in law with trust that you can make that when setting up the trust or even tweaking your trust or adding a codical to an existing one where it does give trustee that option far more readily to move that to somebody of their, their choice. Because I, maybe I just can't do it. Because I, I think that's become a common problem with trustees. They, they were kind of stuck in this role and it was overwhelming and they didn't know what to do. So Again, that's a, that's a legal question. I'm just, I just I I know in conversations I've had with lawyers, it's far more flexible than it was. So have that. So so that might be a perfect example. You know what? We can't do this anymore. We'd rather have a corporate trustee. Have that conversation with the lawyer because the lawyer has to do this for you anyway, even if you change an existing trust. Um, just I would say if somebody's in that situation, explain that predicament to the lawyer. Say here's. We understand there is some flexibility. What do we need to do to accommodate that? Um, so that's really a legal issue. But yes, there is some flexibility. How much can a person withdraw per year from the Hanson Trust? Currently, the currently the the benefit is ten thousand dollars for somebody under the age of sixty five without affecting ODSP. Now that's just for everyday use. Um, for anything you're buying that is a, um, you know, the trustee wants to buy the, the beneficiary a, a new car or they want to um, they want to put money into an RDSP or they want to do something. Those are those are all exempt. Anytime you pull money out that's going towards an exempt asset, that doesn't count. So you can pull out as much as you, you want to buy a house. Somebody wants to buy, you know, they've got a million dollars in a Henson Trust. And they want to spend $500,000 on a condo. Trustee can go ahead and do that. It won't affect ODSP a bit, but just in terms of everyday money and ODSP reporting, ten thousand dollars seems awfully low. That hasn't changed yet. It probably will. Of course, after age sixty-five, that doesn't matter. But for in terms of ODSP, if you're talking up to that age, that's the limitation income-wise from from the trust itself. Next question: Is there a fee charged by an institution for an, an RDSP? I know I don't pay fees for, for RDSPs. I, I don't think most institutions do charge fee, like an opening fee. 
there'll be a fee to, there'll be cost to, you know, manage the investments, be it through a private, uh, you know, if you're dealing with a fee for a service advisor, if you're dealing with mutual funds, there's always a fee for something. Um, and banks, I mean, they've got a platform where they've got portfolio managers and advisors running this thing. So typically with any fund, if it's a, any mutual fund or anything along those lines, it's um, by, by compliance wise and general rules, any, if you're researching RDSPs and you're looking at funds or returns or anything, any reporting that's done with mutual funds, for example, is always net whatever management expense ratio or fee was in there. But um, again, you'll, ha you'll have to talk specifically to the institution, but most of them, it's not like, well, we're gonna charge you $100 just to open a plan. Uh, I think that's very rare. If it is, I'd probably go to another institution. And can a person access their RDSP before the age of 60, as long as they wait 10 years after final contribution? Absolutely. Okay. And so, so somebody who's starting fairly young, you're 22 years old, you get this thing started, you're 42 and you've, you've maximized everything. Now you can, you can start your, your, then you can start pulling out the kind of what are called the disability assistant, the one-time payments. The ongoing one won't start till 60, but yes, you have access to those funds. You won't, you won't have to pay anything back to the government after that 10-year vesting period. So. Um, someone said um, she was late coming on. Uh, did you already cover how to claim a disabled child as, an, as a dependent? Yeah, that's on the tax credit that P2201 tax credit form. So when you look at that form, the first page is going, the first section is going to say, you know, who's the, who's the better, who's the person with the disability? Then below that, the exact reading, I've got a form in front of me. Um, tell us a sex page, question two is tell us about the person claiming the disability amount. So that means if a parent or somebody else is claiming the amount, that means whoever has the disability is dependent upon the person claiming it. So that is, that's, that's the second part of that page one of the tax credit application. So that's where the government will ask questions. So the first question they're gonna say, does this person live with you? If the person lives with you, then it's pretty clear they're dependent upon you. Even if they pay a little bit of rent, it's probably well below market rate. They're dependent upon you for their, for their you know, that part of you know, food, shelter, clothing. So shelter, so that they won't ask anyone. If they're not dependent upon you for that, it's like my mom's case, for example, brother and sister, you know, are they dependent upon you? Yes, how? You don't have to provide receipts or anything, but here, I, um, you know, I assist them with groceries on a monthly basis, or I take them shopping to buy clothes several times a year, something along those lines. The government just only really want to know, because it's become a very fraudulent tax credit, because people are trying to, do exactly that, go back retroactively and get money for somebody they absolutely have no, don't support whatsoever. All they want is a tax and people have, have tried to do this. So if you're a parent or, or a sibling or something along those lines and the government sees the relationship is there, they're going to know by somebody's tax return, my brother and sister's case, for example, their only income is ODSP it's pretty evident that you know you're living pretty well at the poverty line. So to to assume you're dependent upon a parent to help assist you with things is pretty straightforward. Um, but that will come out in section two. They'll they'll say you know, how were they dependent upon you? So you, you just kind of outline that right on the application itself. <clears throat> okay. Um, the next question: What are the withdrawal limits for an RDSP? Uh, per year before 60. So that's where you have what are called, right now it's disability assistant payments, which are roughly up to 10% of the plan. This again, the, the, the dynamics of RDSPs are constantly changing. There's a, there's a firm out in BC who's very strongly advocating that money can be pulled from, should be able to be pulled from an RDSP to buy a property, to buy a, to buy a house. Over the course of, there's been a lot of changes since 2008. Once upon a time, for example, if the disability tax credit lapsed, two years later, the RDSP had to be closed. That's no longer the case. 
if you have a tax credit that expires, it will have no impact on what's already in the plan, just you won't be eligible for money moving forward. The, um, you know, the ability to roll over registered assets from parents, that changed over the course of time. Siblings now being able to be account holders has changed. I wouldn't be surprised if the vesting period changes, but the disability amount per se at the moment is kind of limited. And you'd have to, every institution kind of calculates that differently. So talk to whoever, but, but you can kind of gauge roughly 10% of the value of a, of a plan, but talk to your institution if that's gonna be your situation to withdraw that. And if you've put in more money, like my sister, for example, she doesn't have grants or bonds. Her money came because she sold a condo. You're in that situation or your parents have put in far more than the 30,000. If you've got more money in there than the grants and bonds, you can pull money out whenever you want. So, so it can be used for other purposes um, without, that, without that tax credit. So it's really if the grants and bonds kind of outweigh your contributions that you have to worry about that vesting period. And that, that again, gets so complicated. I, I, there's no point spending too much time explaining it. Talk to, talk to specifically to whoever's dealing with it, and you'll, you'll get the answer on it. But you do have the ability to pull money out, yes. Um, I was just at a, an American um, uh, support group, and um, they uh, were discussing, but they, their laws are so different. And they have this um, book that they were using uh, when mental illness strikes, uh, and uh, it was about helping your family members with, you know, disabilities, schizophrenia. Um, do we have any books like that in Canada that describes everything that you're saying? I, I kind of just talk to my own <laughs> sources, to be honest. There probably are some books that will talk about the tax, the tax implications of it. Offhand, I couldn't even tell you what that who 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 to refer okay. to for that but i um so the short answer is i'm not really aware of of one that does exactly that there are so many different publications by various people or institutions on specific sectors like the tax credit or on on a henson trust or you know mckenzie has a great white paper on the rollover of registered assets um but putting it all together in one book um is probably something that and, and, and you know what, but at this point that may have been done and I'm not even aware of it yet. So I'd hate to, I don't want to say no, but I'm just not aware of it. I, I haven't really found it necessary, but it's it's probably something I should look at just to, to people have that question. You know what, I'll send it to you and maybe you'll write a book. <laughs> you never know. Um, it's you, you, never, you never know. Yeah. Um, the other thing is some families are asking what happens, you know, after, you know, you pass away. Mm -hmm. And how do we know if our family members are going to be taken care of? Well, let's say, you know, they don't have an ACT team or someone looking after them. How do we know if they're going to get to the hospital if they need it? How do we know if they're going to be taking their medication? Like, how is that put in place? That's well, I mean, everybody has to put that in place I, I really on their own with either family members or advocates. Or, you know, I, I, again, I get, that's where a lot of people fall through the cracks, right? They, if there are no family members, you, you can walk through downtown anywhere and you'll see all kinds of people on the streets or somewhere because there's nobody really there to do that for them. So this is all part of the estate planning process and your retirement planning process to create a capital or a pool of money. If you have to, if you have to put those, those practices in place yourself that will require resources to do it, you go ahead and you go ahead and do it. Um, by default, it kind of goes to family, but you know it can go to different organizations. And who knows with funding and governments, what the you know the organizations we have today, act teams like you talk about, or social workers, or where my sister resides at Park down in in Parkdale in Toronto, will that funding be in place? Housing benefits, what will it look like in twenty years? Um, nobody really knows. Um, so, so these are all part of the reasons why parents will try and create that pool of money and that capital and have, have somebody, relatives, somebody in place. That's what the trustee kind of does. It's like, they're the advocate. They're the person who's going to look at that person's needs and carry out what the parents wishes would be if they were there. But if there's nobody there to do that, um, that makes it challenging. Yeah, you know, there's a lot of families that um, 
you know, only have uh, one child or, mm -hmm. and they do not sure. have anyone else to help them, you know, manage this. So they have to put their trust in a trustee or lawyer or et cetera. Yeah, and, and depending on the nature of the disability, some people are in supported homes or supported independent living homes. There are many, many organizations that help it, but on the mental health side of it, it, it seems to be far more problematic than in, in some other areas. Um, and they're kind of left off in their, on their own. Um, so that's a, that's a good thing to talk. Those are good conversations to have with other, other individuals. I know with the Schizophrenia Society, there used to always be monthly support meetings with parents. It was a great avenue for people to sit and discuss. Those who have been through it could tell people coming through it, here's, you know, here's what we did, here's what worked, here's what didn't work. People, things of like what you're talking about, what have other families done? And those are kind of some of the, some of the networks you can, you can look at. Um, and other families who are in that similar situation are a great resource. Right, and we do offer an, an open discussion in the speaker series. So we do talk about it, and that's some of the um, concerns that we have as caregivers, like what happens to our family member when we're gone or what happens if we're uh, unwell and we can't take care of them sure. because we can't take care of ourselves. So what's yeah. going to happen for our family members in the future? It's uh, and, and a lot of people are overwhelmed with just trying to manage the day to day life with their family member who has us, uh, you know, schizophrenia, bipolar, whatever uh, disability they have. And what's different with us is that we don't have that transport funding uh, that mm -hmm. the de developmental uh, families have. Exactly. Yeah. I mean, passport funding goes a long way to helping with some of these things to to fund some of those those needs. I mean, there are there are micro boards and things like that that are fairly new. I'm not really involved with any, so but I but keep that in mind for somebody if they're thinking, okay, let me look at what a micro board does. Well, you will get a pool of families who come together to do kind of exactly what you're talking about. Um, so this is where families will often pool their resources and get together to try and take care of each other. Um, so and you're going to probably see more of that as 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 we go along, um, because people are getting a little bit more innovative and, and these problems are surfacing. How do we address these issues? Yeah, we have the resources or the capital to take care of the needs, but who's gonna who's gonna manage it? Who's gonna who's gonna actually you know see it come to fruition? Um, so those are good discussions to have with other people. Well, you know, what have you been doing? What did you do for your planning around this? And you'll get you'll get good feedback, or maybe hopefully get some good feedback. But other yeah. other parents who are in in the exact, they're they're often the best people to talk to because they've um you know they've they've experienced the same same challenges. Absolutely, and there are families, and I, I was just at a discussion with caregivers from all over uh, Canada, and in some provinces, families are getting together and buying a, or renting um, a triplex or a number of um, of units in a, in a condo building. And working together, um, helping support each other, uh, right. each other's children. Mm -hmm. And 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 I and I think that's a great that's a great thing, and and that is happening more and more frequently. So those are if for somebody who's in that situation where that's the concern, explore some of those options. Well, unfortunately, there's not a lot of supportive housing for family members with mental health challenges, mm -hmm. and um, and some of them are just not great. So I guess that's something that caregivers have to um you know advocate for and um because there isn't a, a lot of housing available at this yeah. point in time i would like to thank everyone for coming to this really informative um discussion and i really want you to go on to dan's uh, uh website he has lots of resources uh that um that uh I'm sure that it will be informative for you. Videos, lots of um, extra information. Um, and it's really important for us to really learn because uh, we really don't have a lot of time for ourselves and also time to really look at the future. Um, so, you know, and, and also, um, you know, our a lot of our kids are um, 
you know, are, are financially dependent on us. And, you know, sometimes we worry, will we have enough money down the road for our family members to help them after we're gone? So there's a lot of things to tackle. Maybe as a group, we can get together and look at some of these um, these solutions to some of our problems. And uh, Nancy, I will send the website out. Just get on my um, uh, on my um, email list, which you are, and um, I will send all the information to you. Dan's um, presentation will be on Home on the Hills website under YouTube, and I will let everyone know when it's available. And um, thank you so much, everyone, for joining in. And thank you, Dan. This has been probably the best um, uh, discussion and, and presentation I have heard in all okay, the times well, that I've been doing this. Um, well, my this pleasure. And thanks for the kind words. I'm, I hope no, it was, people, it was, they found it was fabulous. And I, I think yeah. you really understand what we're going through um, because you also have family mm -hmm. members that are... Um, you know, are in the same situation. And I'm glad that your your brother and sister are doing well and living independently because so much so much of so many families hope uh, that one day our family members will be independent right. and I, living I, a good I'll life. Tell you, I'll, I can tell you what will happen after something like this is somebody some couple will will and I'll I'll, I'll see this at the Phoenix program or something all the time. Somebody will say we really need to meet and we want to have a discussion. <laughs> and they don't want to, they, they're in no position to do the financial stuff at all. What they really want to know is their child's going to be okay. What was it like for your brother and sister? So, I mean, I, I just as happily go to those meetings as I do to any other, because I can certainly understand that. And I've seen what it, what it's been like for all of that. So, I mean, hopefully some people take some, some hope on this. I know it's a challenge. I know it's a struggle. I know there's, there's all kinds of things, but, but yes, you're right. My, my brother and sister are certainly stabilized and are doing better than they than they were, and um, and that yeah, that's a, that's a blessing for our family just to be able to to see that. And I um, anybody has any other personal questions kind of relating to that, I'll talk to anybody. So just shoot me a shoot me a note, and you know, evidently I'll just carry on talking until somebody cuts me off. So anyway, <laughs> but, I, but it was a pleasure to be here. So thanks for having me. Thank you everyone for joining in yeah. and. Um... Everyone said it was a fabulous and very informative uh, evening. And uh, thank you for your expertise. And um, I was going to let you know that our format is changing. I will not be doing a speaker series every month. It'll be every other month. And um, and uh, the uh, well now there will be a charge of $20 um, to attend a seminar uh, due to lack of funds for our programs. So um, I hope that won't deter you from, from uh, joining us next time. And uh, I really thank you all for coming. And I, my head is swarming. I have, you know what, I didn't know half of this stuff. So uh, it's a lot to take in, but uh, I'm, I'm, we're glad that you're there to help us along. Thank you so much, Dan. All right. Have a good night, everyone. Okay.